Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, March 16th, 2022. And today in history, March 16th, 1751, James Madison was born. So a big happy birthday to the guy that we call the father of the Constitution. And on this episode, rather than giving you kind of like a biographical hit list of all the highlights of of the great work of his life and maybe some flip-flops and things like that, I actually want to primarily explore that title as a question. Is Madison really the father of the Constitution? Uh, I'll do a little biographical history uh, on James Madison, but then I'm going to share with you what I think is the most concise, uh, the best overview of why he's given that title. I'll go through some of the history behind uh, those actions that he's taken, and then I've even got his own view on the question near the end of the show. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific Time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage is everything you need to follow us. It's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's long, but it's easy peasy, all spelled out. 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. There you're going to find all the archives for almost four years of this uh, show Uh, On individual episodes, I publish a blog post about one to two hours after the live show is done, and there you're going to find all the different platforms we're on. We're on a bunch of video platforms, and my favorite live streaming one is odyssey.com. It's decentralized and censorship resistant, O-D-Y-S-E-E.com. We also have the audio-only podcast edition at Podbean, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple, and all the rest, as many places as possible. Uh, You'll find all the stuff that I'm referencing. I've got a bunch of original source documents and uh, other articles and episodes and things like that for you to check out with this one. And you'll be able to, the stuff that I mention in the show, you'll find in the show notes, the additional links section as you scroll down so you can read and learn more in context on your own time. And of course, we have our membership program where you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month. Uh, Again, that's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And while we allow people another minute or so to get uh, notifications to join us in the live stream, these mainstream platforms aren't as awesome as we'd like them to be. Uh, Hi to everyone out in the live chat. There's Patricia Dance. Good to see you. Glad you made it live. Tim Martin in Arizona, DHD. Oh, and Tim, appreciate your email. Uh, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. (laughs) As soon as I can. I'm really slow on getting back on emails, but I did read that one and I appreciate your update. DHD Van Horn in Washington, Phenom in uh, Tampa, Tyler B. Good to see you as well, buddy. Cheriton Farmer, Jennifer Coop in uh, beautiful Chafee County, Colorado. M. Gabriel, like the long intro. I started a little early to get things rolling. Teacher of Liberty, my great buddy. Good to see you, man. Uh, especially on a live episode. I really appreciate you. Uh, Alan Hughes and everyone else. Thank you so much for being here. But let's get right to this. I will check the chat a little bit later in the episode or later on today. See if there's any questions I can get back to. You can also email me with suggestions for episodes in the future at team at 10th Amendment Center dot com. Let's start it out with a little basic biographical stuff since it's the birthday and here from Montpelier dot org, which is, uh, I guess, the foundation that runs it. James Madison, founding father, architect of the Constitution, architect of the Constitution, and fourth president of the United States, was born on March 16, 1751, at his mother's home in Port Conway, Virginia, on the Rappahannock River near Fredericksburg. His parents, Nellie Conway Madison and James Madison Sr., he's a junior, couldn't have known that their eldest child would have a major role in shaping the collection of British colonies that currently inhabited they currently inhabited into a nation that would ultimately become a global superpower. Now, I did want to take a quick aside from my overall uh, conversation here about this question, whether or not James Madison was the father of the Constitution, whether he was or not. I find it interesting that Montpelier talks about how Madison had a role in shaping the nation into a global superpower, shaping a nation as a global superpower. That was not his goal. And in fact, even where he was debating with Patrick Henry in the Virginia ratifying convention, he being for and Patrick Henry being against ratification, he specifically said, and this was, I think, on June 7th, 1788, that summer uh, during the debates, I agree with Mr. Henry that, quote, national splendor and glory are not our objects. National splendor and glory are not our objects. James Madison wasn't uh, trying to create a a world superpower and empire. In fact, he thought that the idea of a standing army 
was a great threat to liberty, and he preferred that you build up a strong militia, volunteers, and the right to keep and bear arms instead. Anyways, moving forward beyond that question there, uh, what I actually found in discussing this question, this question, is James Madison, or why is James Madison called the father of the Constitution? The most concise answer I found of all places is at Quora.com by a guy named Gary Porter in Virginia. He put it this way. Here's why. Madison almost single-handedly caused the convention of 1787 to happen. He drafted the initial Virginia plan, and I'm going to explain what these things are in a little bit more detail. He, he drafted the initial Virginia plan, which provided the basis for initial discussions at the convention. He was absent only a handful of days when he was too sick to attend, and he wrote the most complete notes of the proceedings ever produced, no one else comes close to that title. So if we're going to call someone the father of the Constitution, Gary Porter says, well, this is why. So uh, if someone's going to be called that, here are the reasons why. So let's look at a few of these things. I want to start out with, you know, did Madison actually call for the convention or did he really agitate for it? And Wikipedia of all places, they actually have a nice overview of that time in the 1780s. And they note that Madison, and they are correct, he was regularly agitating for reform to the Articles of Confederation. In fact, Madison was actually more concerned about the states being the problem rather than the centralized power being the problem. He saw it as an excess of democracy and leading towards factions and things like this. And this is how he put it, or they put it in a wiki. Throughout the 1780s, Madison advocated the, for reform of the Articles of Confederation. And I like that they put reform rather than replacement. He became increasingly worried about the disunity of the states and the weakness of the central government after the end of the Revolutionary War in 1783. He believed that excessive democracy, and they put it in quotes because that was his term, caused social decay and was particularly troubled by laws that legalized paper money and denied diplomatic immunity to ambassadors from other countries. He was also concerned about the inability of Congress to capably conduct foreign policy, protect foreign trade, and foster the settlement of lands between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River. And here in his own words, this is how he describes it years later in a letter to John G. Jackson in 1821 describing that time. He said this was a time where there was a crisis had arrived, which was to decide whether the American experiment was to be a blessing to the world or to blast forever the hopes which the Republican cause had inspired. He saw it as a crisis, of course. Patrick Henry in those Virginia ratifying debates, the ratifying convention debates, he's like, you know, I keep hearing that, you know, if we don't make a move on this right now, things are going to come to an end. But th this is kind of alarmist. I don't agree that it's going to be uh, we've got a serious problem. Maybe there's been some issues. They've been resolved, but we don't have to rush into this kind of thing. Anyway, so he's been calling for throughout the 1780s. He's calling for reform to the um, to the Articles of Confederation. And finally, by 1786. He, on the urging of uh, James Madison, and I think it was actually John Taylor, John Taylor of Caroline, the great Jeffersonian states' rights guy in Virginia, made the call for a convention. But this was the Annapolis Convention in Maryland. And here from Teaching American History, they put it this way, meeting at the suggestion of James Madison in Annapolis, Maryland, beginning on September 11, 1786, the Annapolis Convention was held to discuss some issues of interstate trade. So it was primarily a commerce discussion. And then at the convention, they actually resolved unanimously to approve a resolution from Alexander Hamilton, a resolution calling for the convening of a special convention to amend the, I like that they put the weak Articles of Confederation, amend the Articles of Confederation, because that's editorializing, for a number of serious defects. So, I mean, it, the attendance was not low. There was only, I think, 10 or 12 delegates. What does it say here? 12 delegates total, representing five states, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Virginia. Madison was there leading the Virginia delegation, and he, of course, supported unanimously and worked with uh, Alexander Hamilton to make that call. Now, it didn't, because, you know, there weren't, it wasn't attended well. There was no actual legal impact by the Annapolis Convention, but it certainly helped uh, build some groundswell of support, and eventually we had the Philadelphia Convention get called in 1787 or for 1787. Now, here again from Montpelier.org, they say he was only 36 at the time. Madison, then 36, spent the months leading up to the convention in Montpelier's library, studying many centuries of political philosophy and histories of past attempts at Republican forms 
of government. The founders in general, they wanted to understand history. And it's cool that Teacher of Liberty uh, is here in the chat, Joel Wolverton, who runs a great uh, project called The Founders Recipe, talking about the people that the founders learned from. The founders in general. So Madison didn't just cram those last three months in to try to learn history. The founders in general, the founding generation, they were well-versed in stuff that we never, ever, ever hear about. People like Algernon Sidney, who I've covered very briefly on this show in the past, with Thomas Jefferson. Now, he was actually uh, executed for publishing, a, for writing a book, not even publishing, from my understanding. And Jefferson considered his book on government the best one in existence. Anyway, so the founders understood history, but Madison really, really, really studied aggressively in the months leading up to the convention because he wanted to be well prepared. The concern was, if you have a similar scenario and a similar structure of government, you're, you should expect similar results. So they wanted to avoid the problems of the past. Madison was a great student of history. Here from Dave Benner. At the convention, he says, along with Edmund Randolph, Madison constructed the Virginia Plan. That was the second thing in Gary Porter's list. A proposal for a nationalistic government model that became the basis for much of the debate during, uh, especially the early part of the Philadelphia Convention of 1787. The Virginia Plan, nationalistic. We think of James Madison. Of course, if John Taylor called the made the call for the Annapolis Convention, we think of these guys more as kind of like Tenth Amendment states' rights people. <laughs> but the Virginia Plan was nothing of the sort, and James Madison was one of the primary authors of it. In effect, and this is from uh, Rob Nadelson, he says, the Virginia Plan was a scheme, I like that he calls it a scheme here, was a scheme in which the states would survive only as corporations. This is very Hamiltonian. Madison himself was really on board with this. He definitely changed his tune from before to during and after ratification. I don't know why. Maybe Joe Wolverton, who's written a book on Madison as well, would know better than me. But in, in effect, the Virginia plan was a scheme in which the states would serve as only corporations, fulfilling the kind of subordinate roles that local government played in England. Oh, wow. I just zoomed in there on the screen. There we go. Now, Here's how Madison put it in a letter to George Washington. They were putting together their plan. This is before the convention actually started. This is discussing what ended up becoming the Virginia plan. This was April 16th, 1787. Here's how Madison put it. I would propose that in addition to the the present federal powers. So they wanted to say that under the uh, Articles of Confederation, Congress had a certain amount of powers, but he wanted to add to that. The national government, notice he calls it national at this point, specifically calling for a very consolidated centralized power because he was concerned about the problem of the states and he wanted to have a centralized power to do it. I, it kind of surprises me, but maybe someone else understands that better than I do. The national government should be armed with positive and complete authority. Listen to this. This is what he's saying behind the scenes, telling George Washington, hey, we're going to work on getting this done. you got to get up here. Come on, let's do this, man. Uh, the new national government, my plan is they should be armed with positive and complete authority in all cases which require uniformity. Now, that's not too far off before I get into the rest of the quote. One of the leading causes of the revolution, the war, the reason that they took up arms against Britain, the war for independence, for secession. John Hancock, specifically in his 1774 Boston Massacre Day oration, summed it up where he was talking about this. Like, look, they've got the power over us, and specifically they called it in all cases whatsoever. Thomas Paine in his American Crisis, uh, December of 1776, when things weren't going well, he was specifically saying, hey, we can't give up now. We can't negotiate with them because they still claim the power over us in all cases whatsoever. John Dickinson who was kind of the moderate guy, slowing things down towards independence. But he and Thomas Jefferson in 1775 co-authored the Declaration of Causes of Why They Were Taking Up Arms. Wrong title, but I'm just paraphrasing. And they, Dickinson and Jefferson together, and I think this had more Dickinson influence, specifically said, why should we enumerate our problems with the crown in detail, like they did the following year in the Declaration? Because they claim the power over us in all cases whatsoever. So the fact that even used in this letter to Washington Washington in all cases, in all cases which require uniformity. That's very, it's not too far off from what they were actually fighting along, what they had fought a long bloody war for 
to get away from the British. Now, he was 36 at the time here in 1787, but he was definitely old enough to know what was going on in 1776, such as the regulation of trade, including the right of taxing both exports and imports, fixing the terms and forms of naturalization, etc., etc. They wanted a very powerful government. And he said, now, over and above this positive power, a negative in all cases whatsoever on the legislative acts of the states as heretofore exercised by the kingly prerogative appears to me to be absolutely necessary and to be the least possible encroachment on the state jurisdictions. I chuckle at that because he's calling for a congressional or a national veto power on any piece of legislation in any state on any issue in all cases whatsoever. That is a centralized kind of a, it's very similar to a monarchy. And he specifically says it was exercised by the kingly power. And he thinks that that's the least encroachment on the states. It's nuts. Without this defensive power, he thought it was a defensive power because they were concerned that if the states couldn't be compelled to do whatever they want, then the states would just not participate when they didn't want to. And then the states would be able to undermine and defeat federal programs, which he flip flops to a few years later in, well, the following year in 1786, and saying that it was a blessing, really. He said, this defensive power, without this defensive power, every positive power that can be given on paper will be evaded and defeated. So at first, this is going to be a negative. Here's Nadelson again. This is a nice overview of the four main points of that Virginia plan. He says, by the terms of the scheme, the new government would receive the cumulative total of powers, one, that Congress had enjoyed under the Constitution, two, in which the separate states are incompetent, and three, necessary to the harmony of the United States. So basically anything and everything, the way that they treat it today, whatever we want, any uh, necessary and proper is whatever Congress determines is needed to govern over. And then on top of it, in addition, Congress would receive, number four, a plenary veto over state legislation. Total veto. I've got the text of that Virginia plan. Uh, there's three different versions from Yale Law School. Uh, here linked up in the show notes. I've got it up on the screen here. I'm not going to read through any more specifics beyond that because that's really the highlights of what happened. Now, as Dave Benner notes, it was primarily voted down. He says, though many of the key elements of his plan were discarded by the convention, Madison, along with Randolph, was tasked with explaining the end result of the Constitution in Virginia. And additionally, he lent his effort to the ratification struggle in New York through his writings in The Federalist. And Dave is absolutely correct because The Federalist Papers are given totally, uh, they're given too much prominence in understanding the Constitution. They're a marketing tool. I mean, there's much truth there, but they are certainly, a, if we understand the context, they were a marketing tool to sell the idea of ratification in New York State, where it was very likely that ratification was going to lose and could have led to a domino effect. So it was primarily influential on New York. It was not very influential at all in the other con state ratifying conventions at the time. Now, today, and maybe because Hamilton wrote so many of them, everybody wants to cite the Federalist as if the Federalist was the Constitution itself. The Federalist is important in understanding the views that were being sold to the people in context, in opposition to anti-Federalist papers, many of which the Federalist papers were direct responses to. So if you don't understand both sides, you can't even understand what they're saying in the Federalist. Within the essays, Dave writes, he described the Constitution as a model that would delegate few and defined powers to the general government and general government, not central. Notice how at first he was saying national and cent national government that he wanted with George Washington. And then when we're talking about the Federalist Papers, because he didn't get that national government, it was partly national, partly federal. He started making the case that this was a positive. Now, maybe he changed his tune because he was convinced that this was the right way forward or he was more of a pragmatist. And he's like, well, I, we're going to get what we're going to get. And I know there's a letter that he put to George Washington. He's like, some of the things, it wasn't even close. We got some of what we want. Now we just got to roll forward and push to get this ratified. So maybe he was a good marketer. I'm not 100% sure. Within the essays, he described the model, the Constitution as a model that would delegate few and defined powers to the general government and wrote that ratification would be a federal act, not a national referendum. And Dave's actually referring to Federalist Paper number 45. This is one that I think most people who follow Madison's work are familiar with this, but I want to read the, the quote in context. He said, the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. 
those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. So this is the notion of positive grant. The, the general government, the federal government would only be able to exercise those powers positively granted or delegated to it in the document. And the police powers, the power of the states as the people of each state determine under their own state constitution, which they can modify as they see fit, they, those powers are numerous and indef indefinite. You can't actually address all of them in paper. He said the former will be exercised principally on external objects as war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce, with which the last power of taxation will, for the most part, be connected. The powers reserved to the several states, Madison writes, will extend to all the objects which, in the ordinary course of affairs, concern the lives, liberties, and properties of the people, and the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state. And these days, obviously, living under the largest government in, in the history of the planet, it's certainly totally opposite. It's not even close. And then, of course, there's also Federalist 46. I've got it up here, uh, an article that I wrote about this a few years ago. Four Steps to Stop Federal Programs. Madison is actually talking about this ability of states to evade and defeat, which he was complaining about. He thought it was a problem in April of uh, 17, uh, 1787 in that letter to George Washington. He's like, he's concerned about having this power to stop the states and the general government or the national government at the time. They might evade and defeat. So the following year, as he's writing, it's not even a whole year later, it's months later, as he's writing Federalist 46, he's got a whole explanation of how states and the people can evade and defeat federal programs. He advocated that states use legislative devices and a refusal to cooperate with officers of the union and that the people should refuse to obey the federal government as a tool to defeat federal programs. And he said, if enough states ha were in union on this, if several adjoining states, is how we put it, were in unison, this would create an environment the federal government would hardly be willing to encounter. Now, I covered this episode, this in another episode, Madison's flip-flop in comparison with Hamilton with another flip-flop, because all politicians will do that from time to time. Madison and Hamilton, a tale of two flip-flops back in September of 2020. I think it's an interesting episode. I haven't checked it out in a little while, but uh, I will link to that in the show notes so you can as well. And then I also want to point out the other thing that was uh, in that list from Gary Porter. He wrote these extensive notes on the convention. Uh, I've got a link to that that I will put in the show notes from Liberty Fund. This is the debates on the adoption of the federal constitution, volume number five. He actually forbade publication of this because they were sworn to secrecy. He forbade publication of his notes until all the participants in the convention had passed away. He wanted everyone to be deceased before anyone would find out what they had to say. So let's get back to the question with that kind of introduction, I guess, that overview of the things that he did that give him the title primarily. Was Madison really the father of the Constitution? Now, he didn't really get the title until much later in life. And I think it was... Noah Feldman, a historian who pointed out that he probably didn't even get the name until uh, 1829, I believe. He was like 75, 78, almost 80 years old. And this was after the election. Yeah, it was the 1828 election between Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams when they were both claiming to be followers of James Madison. So here's a, a the famous old, uh, you know, founder. This is a really well-known guy. And both sides of the election are saying, no, no, I'm the true true follower of Madisonian principles. No, I am. We know who won on that, but this is where he started really getting the name. Now, more often than, I, than not, from at least the documents I've read, the letters that I've read and things like that, rather than seeing father of the Constitution, which I did find in some places, I've more often found that he was listed as the writer of the Constitution. And a lot of times the term the is either in capitals or italics to give it a real emphasis. Like James Madison is the writer of the Constitution. I've often heard it uh, in more modern times. And I think I probably used to say it as well. Hey, you know, we should listen to James Madison on this issue because, you know, this is the guy who wrote the thing, right? He's the writer of the Constitution. And we hear that quite often. Now, Madison himself rejected the term. And here he is. And let me pull this up on the screen if I can. I'm fumbling with my supposedly magical mouse. Anyways, here's James Madison to William Cogswell. I don't know who that is. March 10th, 1834. He's actually responding to the notion that before he gets to the letter that he is the writer of the Constitution. You give me credit to which I have no claim 
in calling me the writer of the Constitution of the U.S., and he's actually underlining the word the. This was not, he writes, like the fabled goddess of wisdom, the offspring of a single brain. It ought to be regarded as the work of many heads and many hands. And of course, if we were to call James Madison the writer of the Constitution, maybe he's the architect or he's the lead advocate or the most prominent advocate. Maybe he is the father of because of all that work. Just like Samuel Adams, we call him the father of the American Revolution. But we can't ignore people like Governor Morris, who we could probably call the penman of the Constitution. He did so much of the actual text drafting. And he's also responsible heavily for the preamble. There's Roger Sherman, who negotiated the Great Compromise, the structure of the House and the Senate. Luther Martin was influential on the Supremacy Clause. It was kind of a, an in-between between that Madisonian Edmund Randolph approach of the federal government has power over everything versus power there supreme in those things pursuant to the delegated powers of the Constitution. James Wilson in Pennsylvania gave us uh, much of the single executive rather than a group executive, which was being proposed, and the structure of the federal judiciary. And he was a student of John Dickinson, the penman of the American Revolution, who was also the primary author, or maybe we could call him the father of the Articles of Confederation. So he brought quite a bit as far as um, a structure of federalism. And he actually wanted to promote election of senators by state legislatures. He was actually one of the leading, if not the leading advocate in the Philadelphia Convention, supporting election of senators by the states. Madison himself, even at that time, was vehemently opposed to it. So I guess in closing, I don't know if I have an answer to this. On the one hand, I am like, well, he was a really prominent guy who really, really was well known. And maybe this was kind of a name that was given to him as a marketing tool for electioneering later on in life. And they want, you know, after all these years, he's still alive. He's almost 80 years old. This guy is really, really important. And people at the time, the market wanted to give him respect. And maybe that's a good title. Maybe it's not. Madison wasn't a big fan. But whether he is or isn't, I'm curious what you think as well, if he actually qualifies as being a father of the Constitution or the writer or the father of the Constitution. He certainly was incredibly influential on its structure and ratification. And with that in mind, whether he was actually the father of the Constitution or not, here's what he thought was the wisest part of the Constitution. Let me see if I can pull this up in, on the screen. I don't actually have a link for where this quote is from. I think it's one of his Helvidius letters, maybe Helvidius number three. He put it this way, in no part of the Constitution is more wisdom to be found. So this is the guy we call the father of the Constitution, the writer of the Constitution, and he says this part of the Constitution is the one that's packed with the most wisdom. He said, no part of the Constitution is more wisdom to be found than in the clause which confides the question of war or peace to the legislature and not to the executive department. I thought that was a good way to wrap it up. I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I, more than anything, I hope you learned something. I'm going to check the live chat in just a moment. But before I do that, I want to mention again, if you want to put your financial faith behind our work, absolutely nothing helps us roll up our sleeves every single day and work to reach and teach people about the Constitution and liberty and how to defend them when the government refuses to follow their rules, which is constantly, every second of every single day. Nothing helps us do that work more than the financial faith of our members. You can join us for as little as two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. You can also support us. Well, appreciate Tim Dryden for the super chat. Appreciate it. He says, let's get some super chats in for freedom. That is awesome. Thank you so much for your support over on YouTube. You can help us out on like that way as well if you want to kick in financially. But if you don't have the financial means, don't sweat it. There's no pressure on that. I would just be very grateful for any way you can pitch in. Otherwise, you can smash the like button on any of the face uh, uh, mainstream video platforms. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That helps out an absolute ton or any other podcast platform. And sharing links, just spreading the word about the show has been helping us reach a lot more people than I ever expected. Let me take a quick look over in the uh, live chat and see if there's any questions. Uh, Veritas says, writer is not the same as father. Absolutely. I agree. Now, there was kind of a mix and match. He specifically rejected the idea of being considered writer of the Constitution. I don't see him actually supporting any time personally being called the father of the Constitution. I don't know if he was as vehement about the uh, 
uh, about the, the terminology as we could be, but uh, I thought it was just an interesting discussion. Clay Kent, awesome as usual. I appreciate that. Ed Head says, I've come for the Freedom Crocs. Run Level 1 says, I think ultimately it doesn't matter. People should know how all the different men contributed and why. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's important to recognize that. And I thought it was just an interesting question and a good opportunity to go through how, well, if we're talking about the Constitution being a federal document, uh, 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 a union of the sovereign states, and then Madison actually wanted to be a really consolidated government. I think that, to me, is the most interesting thing that happened there, was that huge change. And maybe it was a change of heart. Maybe it was all the communication he had back and forth with Thomas Jefferson, who was away. Uh, Teacher of Liberty puts it this way. Madison was the midwife of the Constitution. That actually is probably the best one, because he really kind of helped uh, shepherd the support for the Annapolis Convention. He really did a lot to actually get it help get it ratified. He did a lot of the historical research to make the arguments. People had pointed that out, like, oh, if we have a question, you know, we know Madison is on top of this. That's an awesome way of putting that. Thank you so much. Patricia Dance, always great to see you. Madison's writing is so uh, brilliant. And teacher says, Teacher of Liberty points out again, that was Helvidius Pacificus letters. Yeah, that was really awesome stuff. We should all read those. And uh Seeing a little bit more here. Oh, yeah. Uh, Joe Wolverton's also pointing out that Madison called for the national government to have veto power. Yeah. And that's such to me, that's such an incredible thing, because we think of Madison as not being on that Hamiltonian side. And as that letter to George Washington points out, Madison may have been more Hamiltonian than Hamiltonian was. Hamilton himself was at the time or maybe not. I mean, that might be pushing it, but he certainly had that same approach. He worked with Hamilton quite a bit. And uh, I think he just moderated, maybe tried to recognize, like, we didn't get what we wanted. Let's roll with this. Anyways, uh, David Wilson says another marketing ploy was the phrase, we the people. Patrick Henry had some complaints about that. There's arguments on both sides. Patrick Henry said, well, who authorized them to say we the people instead of we the states? There's an interesting discussion about that that might be uh, worthy of another episode in the future. Anyways, I appreciate you spending some time with me today. I got to roll. Uh, I hope you're having a great day. I hope you learned something from this episode, and I'll see you next time here on The Path to Liberty.